So what have been the major changes since Mace days? Well, Mace was writing in 1971, and since then there's been a major wave of corporate restructuring because they were, American industry was in big trouble. And we've also talked about the Chandler was just publishing his M form about the success of these companies, just as uh, there were, for, uh, just as the, the whole M form started to struggle, and we had the new, the changes of the re, in the 80s, the Reagan Thatcher revolution, the, the neoliberalism, the idea of actually opening the constitution. And actually, as well as this uh, big turnover in which companies were in the top 400, which is the biggest 400 companies in America. 60 cent of shares are now owned by institutional invest investors and these people themselves are often known as the new capitalists there is a problem here i just want to draw your attention to in the literature regarding, regarding sounding corporate covenants and that is that the new capitalist is often used for two different groups the group one is the one we referred to earlier in the very first lecture and we asked you who are the capitalists and we talked about oh Cap capitalism is about the control of capital. Who controls capital? Well, the managers of big business, and to a certain extent, the good question was asked, does it include institutional investment funds? Yes, to a certain extent, it does include members, managers of institutional investment funds. These are the ones who dictate the investment in capital. Now, I'm talking about maybe about the people who actually handle money that is actually invested in companies rather than handle those that just buy and sell shares. But if you're managing a fund that invests in projects, investing in corporates, or that, you're controlling capital. You might not own it, but you control it. And if you control it, that in a way makes you the capitalist. So you might not own any of the shares, you might not even own any of the money, but you're deciding where it goes, especially if it's a hedge fund, especially if it's going to new tech, if it's going to sort of companies that are being set up. These days, the British government is trying to set up a system in which we might actually pay for infrastructure development by directly by pension funds. If you're a pension fund and you're deciding to allocate capital to build a railway line, you're a capitalist. Even if you do not actually, it is not your capital you're allocating. If you have that much control over it, so that is one group referred to as new capitalists. But also a second set of literature which we'll be looking at refers to the new capitalists as those who have small sums of money invested in pooled vehicles such as pension funds, mutual funds, insurance companies, ISAs and the like. So if you're reliant on insurance company payments, you're reliant on pension funds, you own a tiny, tiny number of shares you have, but which you don't have any direct control over. The other group refers to new capitalists as control of them. So there's a relationship between these two groups, those who actually provide the money. In some ways, this is one of capitalism's great tricks, knowing that you're actually being persuaded to gamble your money, and yet you're still letting the capitalists control the money. And as we saw in the banks, you might have your small investment, you lose your money. The capitalist who controls the bank is bailed out and walks away with it. So when you're reading or writing about governments, be clear about which group you mean when you're using the references. So what happened? Well, the major changes that happened since Macy's day is that foreign corrupt practice laws were introduced in the USA that stopped companies bribing people abroad. Political donations were more controlled. In fact, that has now been rolled back a little bit through the Citizens United. There are more outside directors now. How effective that is, not, we don't know. We've seen actually that Enron was supposedly a, a leader in the use of external directors and was actually very good at using outside directors but it still failed and more directors take their role seriously. There's also been a number of changes that suggested that the law has changed because significantly. So since the early 19th century, state matters have become uh, responsible for registering of companies. Therefore, there's been an element of competition where companies, where different states try and impose lower corporation tax, etc. So they get this tax competition between them. So in the US now, 50% of companies are represented in Delaware. So Delaware law dictates what they should do. Delaware law, a director under the new rules, has a duty of loyalty and care. This means that you actually have less responsibility than you would if you're a trustee of a society or if you're the trustee of a a fund or if you're the trustee of a brownie group or some children's thing, you would first look at the money, you would have a prudent man standard if you're a trustee. A, what would a prudent man do? A director doesn't have to be prudent, they just have to be loyal and caring. And of course, with all sorts of things, if it's who judges loyalty, who are you loyalty to? We've seen already they have many conflicts of interest. But how do you define care? I mean, what do you care about? Who are you are supposed to care about? What due diligence? Who actually does the checking? Uh, so there's a lot of ongoing 
conflicts of interest. There's a lack of due diligence actually being put forward by many, many of these organizations. So it's difficult who decides what the role directs is, what, how do you deal with this conflict? There are other organizations, it must be said, that actually have themselves come up with descriptors of what directors should do. And we're going to briefly look at the end of here at a couple of them. Business Roundtable of America itself defines what it's doing. So this is business saying what they believe a director should do. They're saying a director should oversee management. They should conduct board appointments. Not they're actually saying the CEO actually does this, but the same business roundtable they're knowing good ones of that. Director should manage succession. As soon as they decide a CEO is to go, it is the director's job to choose them. They're actually saying that the directors are the ones who should check the financial performance. And if there's capital funds to be allocated, if there's money to be spent, it is the directors who should do that. The directors still are the conscience of the business. Now, corporate social responsibility is the good part of it. They have to make sure it's that. And the directors have the final say in making sure that everything that the company does is legal. So doing that. At the same time, this is the business view. There is another view. And that often comes from the American Law Institute. The American Law Institute looks at the legal requirements for a company. And what they say is that, as before, they should elect, evaluate, dismiss senior executives. They give the business round table to a certain extent to make sure that actually what he's, uh, what he's done is controlling of the president, etc. They oversee business and sure conduct enhances shareholder wealth. So actually, they're much narrower than saying that actually the company's job is to be profitable, is to make money, so they have to enhance shareholder wealth. They review and approve the corporate plan. Note, as lawyers, they do not draw it up. They look at it after it's been drawn up. They approve the corporate plan. As with the business roundtable, they maintain legal compliance and they make recommendations to shareholders. So they should go directly to the shareholders to explain to them what the decision they should make, how should they go with it. It does suggest, however, that anything that is major, so for instance, a merger or a, de a demerger or a breaking down of things put that major plans the structures should be initiated by the board directors. And if they do not initiate it, they should take control of it and adopt it at some stage. Differences to round tables. It questions whether board members should be involved in broad policy decisions. Seems to be that they should only be uh, specifics. And it actually has liability here. The law is saying that actually directors can be liable for the decisions they make. At the moment within the UK, there's a big ongoing debate in connection with company law reform as to exactly where directors sit and how liable they should be for decisions of the company. So what, in conclusion, is the reality? The guidelines of every course for powerful directors who are knowledgeable and independent. But the reality, of course, is that the CAO controls not only the knowledge and has greater knowledge, the symmetric knowledge and information, but also controls the agenda. The CLO is selecting the other board members. So even if you alone as a board member wish to stand up to the CAO, you're going to struggle because you have to find other board members who have same similar complaints. They may have complaints of their own, but will there be complaints that are be allied with you? Yeah. When the power is operated, if you're trying, if you've made fair study, if the corporation can collapse. If people cannot be made to agree with one another, confusion can reign, the company can actually come into risk of collapse, of going bankrupt. Confused about accountability, law says you're like accountable to the shareholders, but who are you really accountable? This whole course is based on the argument of social accountability. So it's a key question to be asked. And of course, finally, if you are trying to reach consensus, you are trying to cooperate, this starts to undermine your independence. So it's almost like every effort that is made to improve the situation just in fact ends up making it worse. Okay, so discussion points that come out of this that we're going to look at in class. What are the principal roles directors in the firm according to different approaches? How do their actual directors historically support or detract from the theory of managerial hegemony? What makes discovered about the role of directors in US corporations published in the new book? What has changed in US governance since then? Has there been improvements? And identify at least two sources for proposals for how governance could actually be formed by directors. Compare and contrast this with what makes actually found happening. So what was actually going on?